Hi, and welcome to the first lecture on Middle English. We kind of looked at the Old English era and we looked at nearly six centuries of Old English. We looked at the different dialects that formed the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy and we also saw that Old English was very different from Modern English in that the word order was different. Um, there was a lot more inflections to Old English. So let's get into the Middle English era. So the Middle English period is really a 400 uh, a year uh, span starting at 1180 and going all the way until 1580. Now here is the map. This is England before the Norman invasion, which is like the main uh, kind of event that triggered Middle English. So remember that we had the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy, that's seven kingdoms speaking different dialects of English. We also had the two Viking conquests that happened just before the start of the Middle English era. So there was a lot of Scandinavian influence in English at this point. Now, that's when the Norman conquest happened. So who are the Normans? The Norman are uh, Northmen, the Norman for short, they came from Normandy, the region in France. Now, remember that we talked about Alfred the Great in the Old English era. Now, in the line of descent of Alfred the Great, the last king uh, when the Norman conquest happened was Edward the Confessor, and he died. And following his death, Harold, who was a son of Earl Godwin, took over the throne. Now, William, who was the seventh Duke of Normandy, challenged this uh, kingship, challenged the kingship of Harold. This is William the Conqueror. And the reason why he challenged uh, the kingship was because he was distantly related to Edward the Confessor. So he said that he had legitimate uh, reason to be uh, the king of England and Harold uh, did not. And that's why the Norman conquest happened. Now, here's a fun fact. William is actually an old French name, and I know it's a really popular name. It became extremely popular in the United States uh, in the 13th century. It was the most given uh, name among English men. So William is actually from will, meaning desire, and helm, meaning protection, and was introduced to England by the Norman conquest when William the Conqueror uh, came uh, to contest the throne. The Norman conquest resulted in a battle, and this was called the Battle of Hastings. This happened in 1066. This is the last invasion of England. It's called the Norman invasion. And basically King Harold was defeated at the Battle of Hastings by William uh, the Confessor. Uh, and Hastings is currently, it, it is a town that is uh, close to uh, East Sussex. It's a town in East Sussex. Here is the Battle of Hastings um, depicted in Bayou uh, Tapestry. This is in a museum uh, currently. So you can see Edward the Confessor, he's Rex, right? So he's king. Uh, and then he uh, contested Harold, who was Angelorum, who was the king at that point. So here you see they're setting up to go to England for battle. They uh, go in a ship because obviously they have to cross uh, the uh, the channel, the, the French channel, and then they reach um, England and uh, then they prepare for war and, and they uh, fight with the uh, people, uh, the, the soldiers of um, Harold and Harold dies. I don't know if that's depicted over here, but uh, there might be one more piece of the Bayou Tapestry that I don't have in the lecture slide. Now, uh, remember that the last invasion before the Norman conquest were the Scandinavian Viking uh, conquest. Um, and the Vikings came from Scandinavia, but the Norman conquest happened from France. It was rather close to uh, England uh, compared to Scandinavia. Now, earlier around the same time, the Vikings came to England. The Vikings had also conquered northern parts of France. So when the Viking conquest happened, the Vikings not just conquered England, like the, 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 the kingdom of England, but also like parts of European mainland. So the Vikings who settled in Normandy are called as Northmen. They're called Northmen because they came from the north, from Scandinavia all the way down. And this is a French, uh, this is the old French term uh, for Northmen, Norman for short, from Normandy in France. 
So here is a map of Williams, England. So this is William the um, Confessor who uh, became the uh, King of England after conquering, um, after killing Harold and conquering the throne. Uh, so you can see that this is where the Normans came from, right? Um, right here. And they had to cross the English Channel uh, in order to reach um, uh, Hastings and then they conquered uh, England. Here is England in uh, 1087. So this was just after the Norman conquest. Again, here is Brittany, here is Normandy, the English Channel, and then um, England, right, uh, with the domination of William the Confessor. So if you enlarge this and see, you will see that the pink is all um, parts of uh, William uh, the Confessor's kingdom. Now, what happened? What were some of the changes that happened in England under the Norman Conquest? The big change that happened under the Norman Conquest was that a lot more churches and castles were constructed uh, by the Normans. And the Norman French dialect of Norman, uh, of the of the Normans who came from Normandy, developed into an Anglo-Norman dialect of England. So there was a lot of influence from Old French uh, in England uh, during this era. What were the languages in England after the Norman Conquest? There were three languages that were spoken in England after the Norman Conquest. These were Latin, which was the language of the church, Norman French, which was the language of the government, and English, which was the common language of the populi, of the people. Now, there were some uh, factors that led to the decline of Anglo-Norman um, and the resurrection of England, uh, of, of English in England. This was the loss of Normandy in 1204. So Normandy no longer belonged to uh, William the Confessor. The Hundred Years' War that began in 1337 and the Black Death followed by the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. So many political changes that altered the landscape of the Anglo-Norman dialect. And, uh, English, English was kind of restored into back into uh, power uh, after all these uh, events actually happened. There was also some significant changes in the 14th century. One was Lollardi. This was John Wycliffe. He challenged the authority of the church and he was one of the first people to translate the Bible into English. So remember that Bible was not written in English, right? Bible was written in Aramaic. Uh, and from Aramaic, it was translated into Hebrew. From Hebrew, it was translated into Latin. And from Latin, it was translated into English. So by the time you read the Bible in English, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading, remember that it has already undergone four uh, different kinds of translation. And translation, if you've done any uh, class in translation, you know that it's not simple, especially when you go from one language to another language. There's a lot of changes that happen, especially with ter in terms of like lexicon and changes um, uh, to uh, the kind of meaning uh, that develops from one language to another language. This was also the era where there was a development of a mystical tradition uh, from say about 14th century to early 15th century. Uh, some of you who are doing English education might be familiar with some of these texts. Uh, again, as a reminder, this class is a history of the English language. It's not a history of the English literature. So I will not be going into detail um, with respect to the literature. I'm just uh, talking to you about the kind of changes that happened during this era, but you are welcome to read up more about how uh, the literature kind of flourished during this uh, era, especially in the 14th and 13th century, uh, mainly because of Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, who wrote both in English and French. Um, and this was also the era that alliterative unrhymed English poetry flourished, such as Pierce Plowman, uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which I know that many of you have read uh, in, in another class uh, that you're expected to take. Uh, so a lot of uh, literature was written in um, French, it was written in English, um, you know, some people even wrote in Latin. So there was a lot of texts that actually came out during this era. And by the time Chaucer died in uh, 1400, uh, English became the literary language of England. So it was really in 1400 that English really kind of flourished and became the language that English people spoke. 
during this time, uh, because of the influences of Latin, because of the influences of Scandinavian languages that came due to the Viking conquest, there were a lot of influences on vocabulary and especially uh, foreign uh, vocabulary. So the Latin influences are things like folio and dissolve and mercury, redeemer. There are a lot of Latin words in English if you look at the history. Um, and you will be doing your uh, second assignment on this where you will be asked to uh, take a paragraph uh, either from a text or a song or a poem um, and you will be asked to look at the influences of say Latin or other languages on English. Um, there were also Scandinavian. Anything that starts with an S and a C or an S and a, a K uh, usually is a Scandinavian borrowing in English. Uh, there was uh, French influences as well as Dutch and Flemish. Uh, French influence, again, is very easy to see. Um, if you don't know how to spell a word in English, very often that spelling must have come from Latin, such as uh, lieutenant or lieutenant. Um, there are two different pronunciations depending on whether you speak British English or American English. Uh, chauffeur, literature itself is actually from the French. So as you can see, there's a lot of French influence on uh, English currently. This was also the era when Middle English started to look a lot more like modern English. So here are some words in Old English and the corresponding words in Middle English and the translations in modern English. And as you can see, there is absolutely no comparison between Old English and Middle English. They completely look like two different languages. They actually don't look like uh, the same language in a different stage. So if you look at Middle English and at the uh, modern English versions, you can see that the spelling is very uh, same. So you have citizen, mercy, country, uh, and coveted or wanted, and they all look very same, very similar, but the old English versions look uh, very different. Uh, a brief uh, kind of uh, history about Middle English spelling. We will talk a lot more about this in the next lecture. Uh, the Middle English spelling, so this was the era when the thorn symbol was replaced with th, uh, as well as new spelling was introduced for uh, sounds such as g, b, ch, sh, and w, uh, w, h, the, like the who instead of the h and the w. And the reason for this was because of the influence of French uh, on English. So a lot of the French spelling conven conventions actually spilled over to English. So very often, you will see in Middle English, uh, you have these kind of double letters to show length, while the length like E and O. Uh, but again, a lot of these sounds were ambiguous, whether they were E or R, O, etc. So the, the, the sounds themselves were ambiguous, but you can see that instead of having the, the kind of symbol on top, like how we had for Old English, in Middle English, you kind of double the letters and write. You also had a final unstressed E uh, that followed a single consonant that indicated vowel length. So this was the, the E in food, right, or in feed. Uh, this was an unstressed E uh, that again indicated uh, vowel length. The ambiguity kind of persisted. So uh, a lot of this, again, the ambiguity from Old English kind of persisted. Uh, the uh, the found U was commonly written as O, um, and then E, M, N, B, W, were always uh, contiguous in uh, spelling, and uh, the uh, the e the like the y was used for a semi vowel, etc. So uh, Middle English still was in a flux period in between Modern English and mid, uh, uh, in Old English. So it was only when you reach the Modern English era that you start to see a lot of this ambiguity kind of uh, resolve. So let's uh, talk about the dialects of Middle English because now you know the dialects of Old English. Now we're going to talk about the dialects of Middle English. Middle English, just like Old English, had a variety of dialects. These were the main dialects, Northern, Kentish, Southern, West Midland, and East Midland. So these were the five dialects of 
uh, Middle English. The Northern dialect was the continuation of the Northumbrian version of Old English. And I've given you some characteristics. I'm not gonna be talking about this, but you're welcome to pause the video and read through it to understand uh, what were some of the main characteristics of the dialects. Um, but we will talk a lot more about this in the next video when we look at the sound system of Middle English. Kentish was a continuation of an Old English dialect uh, that was spoken in uh, Kent. And there are two notable features of Kentish. And I've given you what those two notable features are. Uh, and again, you're welcome to pause the video and read it. Southern was spoken in uh, West Saxon. Um, and there were a lot of features that were shared uh, with Southern uh, dialect with both Kentish and West Midland which is the next dialect, West Midland dialect. This is the most conservative dialect in Middle English and also fairly documented in literary works. And then the last dialect of Middle English is East Midland. And this is the dialect that later uh, gave rise to the standard dialect of English. Uh, and the characteristics were basically uh, those of the late embryonic Middle English uh, standard. So we will talk about the standard in a minute. Why was there a standard uh, English? Why was uh, standard English uh, kind of developed? The reason was because of the role that England, uh, the role that London played in England, uh, say, starting about roughly uh, 1300 uh, AD. So this is the Thames River and this is London, or this was London. Now London is huge, it's a big city. Uh, but London played a huge uh, role in the rise of the standard English. So. One, uh, and we will come back to this, but literature in dialects. So uh, a lot of these different uh, works were written in different dialects, which is why it's very difficult for you, even if you do an entire semester full of Middle English. Uh, if you don't do Middle English dialects in detail, it's very difficult for you to understand. So Sir Gawain and the Greenwright and Pius Plumman were written in West Midland dialect. Owl and the Nightingale and Ancrony Rivley were written in Southern dialect. Uh, Bruce was written in the Northern dialect, Ladder of perfection, cloud of unknowing in the East Midland dialect. So different literature traditions in different dialects. So the London variety was the East Midland variety. And the London variety was very popular and became the standard. Uh, there were many reasons for this. Uh, but one was that um, the a lot of uh, educational institutions cropped up in London around the 13th uh, century. So that's Oxford and Cambridge, the role of monasteries uh, that uh, we kind of talked about in Old English started uh, decreasing and the universities uh, started developing. Uh, and uh, the dialect that was spoken around the universities was the East Midland um, variety. And the East Midland was also, it's a large uh, popular populous area. It was a wealthier population, uh, politically very important etc. So these were some of the reasons. And the role of Chaucer. We talked about Chaucer before. So this is uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, he uh, kind of wrote in the more um, East Midland variety. He also wrote in uh, the Southern variety. Um, but, but he also kind of wrote in the popular uh, London variety. And that kind of um, improved the standard uh, or it elevated the, the variety into a standard variety. But the main reason why um, East Midland became the standard of, uh, of English was because of the role of London as capital city. Uh, London was a capital city in that it was a political and commercial center of England. It was a seat of the royal coat. There was a lot of intellectual and social activities. There were a lot of trade. People would go in and out of London. Um, and what began as a southern dialect ended up more or less as the East Midland uh, dialect. So really London and Chaucer played a huge role in making the East Midland variety as the standard variety of English. The other reason why uh, East Midland became the standard dialect was because of Geoffrey uh, Caxton uh, and the printing press. So the printing press was introduced uh, to England in uh, 1476 uh, near Westminster Abbey, and a lot of textbooks, a lot of literature was printed. Uh, the printing press came from Germany uh, by Caxton, who learned uh, printing, and he bought the first printing press. Uh, but the the lot of lot of these books by Chaucer and Mallory, uh, etc., were translated and um, printed in the printing press. 
Now, one of the reasons why spelling started to reform in this era, especially towards the end of Middle English and the beginning of Modern English, was because of the printing press. Uh, now, obviously, they needed uniformity, they needed less ambiguity, so the printers had to kind of reform and use certain um, less ambiguity so that people can read the same text and the same text was printed. So that was one of the reasons why, uh, again, the East Midland dialect became the standard dialect, because that was the dialect that was preferred uh, by Caxton and other printing uh, presses. So he was really, Caxton was really kind of, um, he, he is the one who really standardized the spelling. Um, so for example, uh, the influence of uh, Dutch, right, or some other foreign languages, uh, Caxton modernized orthography. So all these z and z and z were eliminated for like the th or dh, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the printing helped to fix the language on the page. So a lot of oddities of English spelling was kind of reformed uh, during uh, printing. What happened when printing presses started printing books? Well, printing made books available at a relatively low price. And what happened was literacy started increasing because the middle class people had access to textbooks. Earlier, the texts were held uh, in monasteries and then in educational institutions like Oxford and Cambridge. But now with the printing press, uh, say roughly around 15th century towards the end of Middle English, uh, the the books started being available to the general public. And so literacy started increasing and the middle class wanted books in English rather than in Latin or French because they didn't have access to Latin and French. They didn't know Latin and French. And so a lot of these books were translated uh, from say Latin and French into English and then they were printed. So here are some effects of translation. Uh, so this is a 15th century text by William Dunbar, Him to the Blessed Virgin. Uh, and there's lots of translations of this, but as you can see, uh, some of the words, uh, for example, from Latin um, were translated into English and you had to kind of make those decisions based on what kind of um, you know, translations you wanted. All right, so that's the end of the Middle English era and I will see you in the next video where we talk about the sounds of Middle English.